healthy digestive system today. Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, so your next exam is lymphatic, respiratory, and digestive. Um, do you have any questions since I'm far away from the microphone? Which do you feel is the harder? For me, it looks like respiratory is harder to grasp. Lim. Lim. Respiratory makes sense. Well, I guess maybe because I missed the in class. Maybe that's why it's harder. Oh, uh, yeah. Me. What's the lecture? Yeah. yeah, probably lymphatic. You did spend a lot of time on the cells already. Um, I don't think any one thing is very challenging. I think the challenge for this exam is that there's three very, very different chapters on it. I'd say that's the main challenge. And then picking out individually from each chapter what to focus on is the challenge. But again, that's what your learning objectives are for. That's what your worksheets are for. Uh, I find this is, again, I don't want to tell you it's easy and then have you not study as a result of that. I say the, the grades on this are pretty consistent or go up a little bit, generally speaking. But again, that going up of grades for this next exam could very well be you know, just trying to get really good grades on exam three in preparation for finals week where you're not going to have all that time to the same extent. So I don't know what the cause of it being higher grades on this one is. It could be easier or it could be more effort put into it. But grades do tend to go up a little bit here. Okay. Digestif. So we'll talk about the anatomy of the digestive system. We'll start from the oral cavity and we'll work our way down. Esophagus, swallowing process, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and accessory organs of the digestive tract. So you do have parts of your digestive system. Your liver, your gallbladder, and your pancreas are all considered accessory organs of the digestive system. And liver is just kind of a huge topic for patho, so we'll do a little extra with livers. Uh, and then absorption across the GI tract. I actually really like this slide right here because it kind of summarizes the entire lecture today. Uh, some of the most important aspects of this are going to be pretty much on here in terms of what we're looking at. We're going to talk about ingestion, digestion, absorption, and how those are different events. Very much how ventilation versus respiration were considered different events, events in the anatomical sciences. Uh, we'll talk about how boluses are moved through the smooth muscle along the system. We'll talk about the tunics, and if you remember the tunics of the blood vessels, the tunics of the digestive tract are not going to be too different. Uh, that's about it. There's not too much to it. Uh, there's some digestive enzymes and where they're secreted from. A couple of, you know, slightly more complicated aspects of it, but nothing too bad, I think. So first, let's talk about peristalsis. And peristalsis is really very intuitive. You really don't need to overthink peristalsis. All we're saying is that there are coordinated smooth muscle contractions that are going to help you move a food bolus forward through your digestive tract. It's called peristalsis. It means that you've got circumferential and longitudinal smooth muscle in the walls of your intestines in the esophagus. And they're going to go in waves of contraction. So they're going to contract here, then they're going to contract there, then they're going to contract there, and it's going to move down, and that's going to be what moves the food bolus forward. The reason we need to emphasize this is, again, because of patho. If this is innervated by the autonomic nervous system, so it's completely involuntary, it's not something you have conscious control over, and because it's autonomic innervation, that means it can go wrong. So you're going to see patho associated with problems of peristalsis. This is a barium swallow. This is a person's esophagus as they're trying to swallow some food, or in this case, barium. And they took an x-ray just the right time, and you see that it's discoordinated contraction of the smooth muscle in the esophagus. And that's causing a radiological sign called corkscrew esophagus. So that fails to move food forward. So again, all you need to know about peristalsis is that it's rhythmic, it's coordinated, and it moves food forward very effectively. Another aspect of smooth muscle contraction that affects the absorptive process is segmentation. And segmentation, it's still going to be coordination of smooth muscle. In this case, the idea is to break apart 
that bolus into smaller pieces and then mix it. And that what that's going to do is it's going to expose new surfaces of that bolus to the walls of the intestinal tract. And that's going to improve absorption. So let's say you already absorbed all of the proteins and carbs from this surface, then we mix it, and new surfaces are now available that may still have proteins in them, or moisture in all likelihood. We're going to see this uh, in the large intestine where we're going to say that's mostly about absorbing water. So peristalsis and segmentation, you can go really simple on this. It's just coordinated muscle contraction. This one to move things further along. This one to mix and expose new sore surfaces to the walls of the GI tract. Some basic anatomy of the oral cavity. If you already have a history with teeth, you'll be really happy, except we don't go into too much detail about teeth. Uh, you do have incisor, incisor canine, premolar, premolar, and then molar, molar. That third molar is the wisdom tooth. For some reason, every anatomy textbook draws everybody with a perfect third molar. Raise your hand if you have a perfect third molar anywhere in your mouth. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, that's the wisdom tooth, and uh, most of us had them removed at a young age, or they're coming in all weird, and they're all impacted, but I don't know. The, hypothetically, we could all have perfect molars if it was a perfect world. We don't. So hypothetically, there are three molars in the adult. Uh, also, in the oral cavity, you've got frenulums. You've got a superior labial frenulum, inferior labial frenulum, a lingual frenulum, and those are those little pieces of skin that sort of anchor things down. When you open the oral cavity, you can visualize the palatine tonsil. That lingual tonsil will be further back, close to that epiglottis, and recall that pharyngeal tonsil is up here in the nasopharynx. What else have we got here? The uvula is that bit that hangs down at the back of the soft palate. Hard palate is anterior. Uh, I don't think that's all I got for you. Obviously, there's a tongue. You have three sets of salivary glands. Your parotid gland is actually surprisingly superficial right here. And then you have a sublingual and submandibular gland. And the purpose of these glands is to secrete saliva. But saliva actually includes, in addition, addition to things like mucin, it, it contains some enzymes, like salivary amylase. And that's not going to be on, this will be on this slide. Salivary amylase is going to help initiate the breakdown of carbohydrates. What that means is digestion is defined as breaking things down. Or sorry, digestion is, yeah, it's chemically breaking things down. That means digestion actually begins in your mouth. You start digesting things in your oral cavity. And just to be super gross about this concept, that also means that you've partially digested everybody you've ever made out with. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> just technically, only if there was Frenching. <laughs> oh, that's just something that you can never unlearn. No worries. So chemical digestion of ingested materials. Salivary amylase breaks down specifically just carbohydrates into simpler carbohydrates. In fact, when you eat something sweet, and then a few minutes later, 30 minutes later, your mouth tastes kind of sour. You guys know that feeling? That's actually a breakdown product of amylase. It's called amylopectin. So you can prove to yourself that that chemical reaction is happening. I do want you to know about the salivary gland structure, what these cells are, and what they are secreting. In particular, that mucus cells secrete mucin, while serous cells secrete the salivary amylase, along with ions and lysozyme. Do you guys remember the job of lysozyme? To lyse things. So it's going to be immunological. We can help break down any pathogens that you ingest. And as far as entry points for pathogens, the oral cavity is a really, really convenient place to introduce a lot of bacteria. So yeah, there's no such thing as a five-second rule. Bacteria is not waiting five seconds. So, yeah, we can, we absolutely need that salivase there. 
or sorry, that lysozyme. Okay, so for a tooth in general, you're going to have the crown and the root. The crown is going to cover the uh, dentin. The dentin is going to encapsulate the pulp cavity. The pulp cavity is where nerves, arteries, and veins are located. So if you are a stressed out person and you're grinding down your teeth, you're starting out by grinding down the crown of your tooth. And it's actually relatively common for stressed out people like us to get down to the dentin. And that is a painless event. It does not hurt for us to grind our teeth down to the dentin. It's only when something like a cavity or grinding gets down to the pulp cavity that it actually becomes painful, because that's where the nerves are. The structure is anchored into the, um, the alveoli. Remember, the alveolar processes, the alveolus is associated with that joint to the tooth. It's anchored in with periodontal ligaments. What else? Uh, there's a layer of a cellular product known as cementum to help them stay in place. All of this is going to make it much more difficult to remove that tooth from its alveolus. Do, do, do. Crown, neck, alveoli, dentin, cementum, enamel. I think we're good. Deciduous teeth are also known as milk teeth. They're their baby teeth. Usually uh, you have 20 deciduous teeth that you lose and are replaced by your permanent adult teeth. You should ultimately have 32 adult teeth. Again, that does include the third molar, the wisdom tooth, four sets of it. So in a childhood skull, you are looking at us basically looking like creepy sharks. That's absolutely a thing. When we remove that, um, that anterior portion of the mandible, mandible or maxilla, we can absolutely see those adult teeth, permanent teeth coming in from behind and pushing them out of the way. And of course, it's kind of a, you never really know if it's going to work out properly or not. That's why most of us got braces as Americans. Uh, so first, the deciduous teeth or milk teeth, central incisor, lateral incisor, canine, and then just two molars is the general pattern for that. I'm just going to point out that dentists are going to number teeth different in a different method than anthropologists. I studied teeth with an osteologist in an anthropology program, and she counted them upper right one, upper right two, upper right three. Lower right one, lower right two, lower right three. But a dentist uses this numbering convention with a clockwise pattern of one to number 32. So your dentist may say that your tooth number 14 is a problem, or it has a, has a cavity. Just to point it out so that the next time you're at your dentist, you know what's going on. Yep. So in this one, 1, 16, 32, and 17 would be the third. The third molar. Yeah, 1, 16, 32, and 17 are third molars that not everybody will have, or if they have them, they may be impacted. Mine are. All four. Woo Just hanging out like that. It's fine. It's fine. Thousands of dollars to have them removed, and they're technically not causing me any pain, so... Okay, I think we're good. Guess what cranial nerve is going to innervate the pharyngeal muscles? Go for it. Vegas! It's just Vegas. Don't overthink it. You may remember from muscles back in AMP1 that you had to learn about the pharyngeal constrictors, the superior pharyngeal constrictor, the middle pharyngeal constrictor, the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. And they're going to help participate in swallowing, and swallowing is a reflex, therefore it will have autonomic innervation. In this case, cranial nerve number 10, our good friend Vegas. Now, we started talking about the mesenteries last week or a little bit earlier because we wanted to understand those mesenteric arteries a little bit better. 
Again, those mesenteric are, or sorry, those the peritoneum and mesenteries, they're fully folds. They are, oh, that's peritoneum. No, that's not going to help me. They're folds of peritoneum that support and stabilize the organs of the GI tract. Every once in a while, I may sub in the word gut tube because that's the embryology term for the digestive tract and all associated organs. They all come from the gut tube. And I just like saying gut tube. It's a really easy, clear way to communicate that we're talking about the entire GI tract at the same time. So the mesenteries help stabilize the gut tube, and they're very, very vascular. So this is a pretty decent dissection of human mesenteries. We are going to see those pig mesenteries today in the fetal pig dissection. And you're just going to have to take my word for it that they're going to be very beautiful. You're not going to believe me until you see them fanned out. Uh, those blood vessels and nerves radiate out in a fanning pattern when you separate them out. And it's actually very lovely and inspiring. So again, to remind you guys, we're talking about a double layer fold surrounding parts of the gut tube. So it's like a piece of fabric that's sandwiching that tube and suspending it in space and then anchoring it to the posterior body wall. Therefore, you'll have your mesenteries, you'll have a mesentery proper, and that's going to, let's see, mesentery proper, and that's going to be what attaches it to that posterior body wall. And again, this is part of the visceral peritoneum. It is folds of the peritoneum. So we will have to consider peritoneal in organs versus retroperitoneal organs. This is mostly related to surgery and how we get to different organs with different surgical methods. But we do have to specify that some organs are retroperitoneal. So for example, you can see this peritoneal membrane right here. They've got an orange tinge to it right here, going this way, folding along. You can see your pancreas is retroperitoneal because of this image. You can see that your duodenum is retroperitoneal because of this image. And you can even see that parts of the large intestine, including the rectum, are, or sigmoid colon, I should say, and then rectum, are indeed retroperitoneal. Your kidneys are also retroperitoneal organs. What this means is that if you're a surgeon, and you have to go in to the kidneys, if you come in through the abdomen, you're going to have to break the, perito the parietal peritoneum to get to the kidneys. Does that make sense for everybody? So pancreas, ascending and descending colon, rectum, those are all retroperitoneal. You can see the kidneys here behind that peritoneum as well. Or peritoneum, some people say peritoneum. Oh yeah, let's also point out that fat curtain. You also have a lesser and greater omentum. So it's actually a fatty curtain. It's probably there mostly for protection. So if you get stomach punched uh, or, you know, punched in your abdomen, you've got a nice little fat curtain. So actually, if you do a human dissection and you open up the anterior body wall and you flip that skin out of the, away from the side or off to the side and reflect that, you then are faced with a big curtain of fat, which you then have to go flirt and pop that off to the side. Yes? Is that anterior or posterior to the abdominal muscles? Posterior to the abdominal muscles. Yeah, so the abdominal muscles will be part of the anterior body wall here. So that gets reflected, and then there's a fat curtain. And I think I've got, there's the omentum. This is the fat curtain. And this is the fat curtain reflected. And this are some human mesenteries. And you can see the human mesenteries are a little bit fatty. Our fetal pig mesenteries will be very clear of fat, and you'll be able to see blood vessels a lot more clearly. So that episode, or not episode, that scene in the Hannibal movie uh, where he disembowels a guy and those guts just spill out onto the floor whole without anything else around them, that's completely wrong. If you're actually going to disembowel a person, you're going to have to go up into the peritoneal cavity and cut that mesentery proper from the posterior body wall. 
then their organs can spill onto the ground. Very yeah. important stuff. Is that even for like babies? Like if mm -hmm. an eight week old is having surgery, they have to go way up in there? Yeah, that's actually a pretty valid question. Infants, um, their mesenteries are a lot more flexible and less stable. So we do have some pathologies associated with intestines um, telescoping in on themselves, rotating around themselves that are more likely in infants than they are in adults who have more stabilized, stronger mesenteries. Absolutely related. Any questions about those? When that does happen, like when there is um, like a intestinal blockage or bulbosis, mm -hmm. does that damage the mesentery? <laughs> It could. So what's happening if your intestine rotates around itself, as in volvulus, um, that is cutting off blood supply. And ischemia to your bowels is generally a bad plan. We do not like ischemic bowels. So. Okay, tunics of the GI tract. Four layers, and this is going to be pretty much true with some slight variation throughout the entire gut tube from the esophagus all the way down to the rectum, you're going to have four basic layers. The mucosa is going to be the part that faces a lumen. And again, a lumen is that space on the inside. So this is, the mucosa is going to have the endothelium. The epithelium facing the inside is the endothelium, and that's the mucosa. And especially in the small intestine, it's going to be very foldy folds. Lots of folds here. Immediately, uh, technically we're going deep to superficial because we are going from the inside out. So be careful with the deep and superficial designations here. Does that everybody understand why I'm saying that? Okay. So actually we go a layer superficial to that lumen and we reach the submucosa. And that's going to be a good passageway for a lot of nerves, arteries, and veins. Then we're going to have a muscularis. And in some places, but there's just going to be one layer of muscularis, and some there's going to be multiple layers of muscularis. This is only illustrating one. Actually, I think it's generally speaking two. Actually, no, it does show two. Uh, circumferential and longitudinal is typically the arrangement for most of your gut tube. So you're going to have muscles that squeeze this way, and then you're going to have muscles that squeeze this way, like it's doing the worm, right? And then superficial to that on the outside of the gut tube is either an adventitia or a serosa. Have I covered the difference between adventitia and serosa yet in here? So both of these words mean a similar thing. They mean the outer covering of something. An organ, a part piece of intestine, doesn't matter. It's the outer covering of it. The difference is that some of Things like your gut tube or a blood vessel, for example, will have adventitia or serosa. Let's use a blood vessel as an example. Some blood vessels are free. The abdominal aorta, you can look into the abdominal cavity, you can grab that aorta. That's going to have, if I recall correctly, a serosa. The outermost layer there, because it's free, would be called a serosa. But let's say your blood vessels inside of the liver and all around you is liver tissue. That's going to, that separation between blood vessel and liver tissue is going to be an adventitia. So adventitia is a covering to separate other things and the serosa is just the outer covering. covering. Yeah. So in this case, you can see it has a serosa. This would be part of the GI tract that you could reach in and grab. And yes, it does have that mesenteric membrane around it, but otherwise it's, it's freely out to the abdominal cavity. There's cavity outside of that structure. So we call the outer layer a serosa. Actually, that mesentery, I think, will be the serosa. So again, you have the mucosa, the submucosa, and that's going to help distribute nerves, arteries, and veins. At least two layers of muscularis, and then either serosa or an adventitia. A serosa is going to be the outer surface into a free environment or a cavity. 
while an adventitia is going to be that organism embedded in something else. So you just have a different type of tissue immediately exterior to that structure. Yeah, it's kind of a nitpicky term. It's, you know, it's kind of semantic more than anything. It's probably too many cooks in the kitchen going in there like, hmm, how are we going to differentiate if it's in an organ or not? Yeah. Yes. So the vasculature in the lungs would be adventitia. Yes. Excellent. All right, if you remember your blood vessels, you already remember this. Yay, it's something you might have to cram into your head right now. Uh, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, inferior mesenteric artery, and their distributions. You have the celiac trunk, most superior, coming off of the abdominal aorta, and that supplies the liver, the spleen, and the stomach. The superior mesenteric artery supplies the small intestine and proximal two-thirds of large intestine, and the inferior mesenteric artery supplies the distal one-third of large intestine and some pelvic organs as well. C-T-S-M-I-M. -M. Any questions about those? Do you guys remember them all right from blood vessels? Now, I mentioned that that mucosal layer in the small intestine in particular is going to be very foldy folds. In fact, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of folds. We're going to talk about folds on folds on folds. We're going to talk about folds you can see, known as plique circularis. And then we're going to talk about um, folds that you can barely see, known as lacteals. And those lacteal, or sorry, not lacteals, um, known as intestinal villi. And those intestinal villi are even going to have cells with microvilli on them. What's always our purpose of having folds? Surface, surface area. So we have increased surface area in the small intestine by three orders of magnitude by literally putting folds on folds on folds, putting microvilli on villi on plique circularis, and it's it just gets folds all the way down. If you look within the lacteals, the lacteal level of foldy folds in that organization, you'll see that that villus contains a artery in a vein, capillary bed, and also a lacteal. A lacteal is a modified lymphatic duct, lymphatic vessel, and the role of that is going to be to drain fats. That's going to have chyle in it. And it's going to drain fats from things that are absorbed from your food. It's going to take them to the liver. It's going to transport it via the lymphatic system back to your circulatory system. And again, you do have malt within your small intestine, and especially in your appendix, we call that multipliers patch. So some of you pointed out on our vocab list for the lab practical that there's some lymphatic structures that are specific to the digestive system, and I told you they wouldn't make sense until today, and that's, that's fine. They're still sorted under the lymphatic system because it's all very much related. Yes? Plique circularis, we do have a slide for it coming up. I'll write it down for you anyway. Mm -hmm. And just as you have that arterial supply, the innervation is named the exact same way. Three autonomic plexuses, the celiac plexus, superior mesenteric plexus, inferior mesenteric plexus. So that makes it really easy, nice and predictable. Again, because it's part skeletal muscle and part autonomic reflex with smooth muscle, we're going to spend probably way too much mental energy on the swallowing process. 
this is, again, going to be coordinated between voluntary and involuntary muscles. So it is a thing that could easily become problematic. So when you swallow, there's a volunteer phase where you have skeletal muscles. Your buccinator is holding food inside of your oral cavity as opposed to it pouching out to the sides of your cheeks. Uh, you press your tongue against your hard and soft palate, thereby moving a food bolus to the pharynx, the oropharynx. When it gets to the pharynx, we start our pharyngeal phase. We have pharyngeal constrictors that help move that to the esophagus. And then that esophageal phase is going to be primarily reflexive, primarily, I'm sorry, the pharyngeal phase should start reflex. The esophageal phase should utilize peristalsis. Now food is in the esophagus, and where peristalsis brings it down through the thoracic cavity into the abdominal cavity. And that means that we have to get past the respiratory diaphragm. Because if you recall, that respiratory diaphragm should be a complete border between the thoracic and abdominal cavity. But there are certain things that have to physically get through it, it's primarily the aorta, the vena cava, and the esophagus, which means you're going to have a hiatus in the respiratory diaphragm for each of those. And anytime you have a broad, important structure like that and you put a hole in it, it's a point of weakness, which is why you need to know about the esophageal hiatus in particular. That esophagus is lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. What's usually the purpose of a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium? What's that? It's definitely not absorption. We've got stratified layers. That's going to help prevent things from going through the layers. Uh, it, it cannot slough off because it's non-keratinized, which is for the best. Imagine what that vomit would be like if we could slough our oh, true. esophagus. <laughs> Ugh, awful. Yeah. Thank goodness we don't slough that. Okay, what's the purpose there? There's another region that, you know, many of us in this room have uh, that has non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium for the exact same reason. For stretch and for, kind of, we're getting there. Resilience, we're getting there. Not quite, that would be smooth muscle, right? It's movement. Friction, protection from friction. So that when, in this case, you swallow that Dorito, um, it's not, it's gonna scrape the layers. It's not gonna scrape down to your blood vessel layers. Every once in a while, I'll swallow a Dorito, right? And that's what's going to happen. So it's a good thing we have non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium because that way when we eat food that is a little bit too dry and scratchy, we're not immediately bleeding into our esophagus. It's actually really important. Does it make sense for everyone? Okay. The other region with this type of skin was the vagina. Okay. Now, in addition to peristalsis, you do have a couple of sphincters, the superior esophageal sphincter and the inferior esophageal sphincter. Uh, I more commonly know the inferior esophageal sphincter as the cardiac sphincter, as in located at the cardia of the stomach, the superior portion of the stomach. One of the reasons I want you to know about that non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium is that this is going to be eroded with frequent uh, esophageal reflux. If you have GERD, if you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, you are going to be secreting acid onto this non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And after some time, erosion takes place and those cells actually undergo an adaptation, actually a mutation, that is going to make them a simple columnar epithelium with lots of tight junctions like you would find in the stomach. Now what happens if you swallow that Dorito? 
Yeah, it's probably going to increase your rate of bleeding. And in addition to that, uh, now you've got mutated cells. We consider that a precancerous condition. So GERD is the reason you had to learn that epithelium type. That's the cardiac sphincter. Okay. So the lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter actually gets worn away after some time with esophageal reflux. And that even further um, worsens the condition because then you can't close off the esophagus as easily to reflux. It's a downward spiral. Yes? What about like throwing up? Absolutely. Constant. Um, uh, vomiting or consistent vomiting if somebody has an eating disorder or if they are having, um, you know, issues with pregnancy, which is really a serious problem with pregnancy for many reasons, especially upward pressure of the developing fetus. Um, yeah, absolutely. Anything that causes frequent vomiting is going to introduce stomach into the esophagus. Yeah, it would definitely cause esophageal erosion, among other things. Although with hyperemesis gravidarium, we're also worrying, and I love the naming convention there, because did everybody catch that name, hyperemesis gravidarium? Does anybody want to translate for me? It's really you throw up when you're pregnant. You throw up yeah. out when you're pregnant, and it's not just morning sickness. It's well beyond that. Um, concerns with that are more about nutrition and electrolyte balance and hydration levels. And yeah, not gaining weight during pregnancy. Is it common? That's because I had it with last week. But is it common for afterwards to struggle with nutrition issues? Probably, I imagine so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a rare condition, though. It's not fun. No. I was hospitalized with all sorts of like the annoying water tub. Really? Huh. It's not Maybe supposed to be because there's the there, there's that line between morning sickness that's normal and then hyperemesis gravidarium is something different. It's you can't even keep water down. Yeah, or mm -hmm. yeah, that's gonna require oxygen for sure. All right, we made our way all the way down to the the stomach with that food bowl. Is finally. No, go for it. Mallory Weisberg, is that another thing, or is that just because I know it's? Does it have another name? I'm not immediately familiar with it. We can look into it. It sounds more like a connective tissue thing, maybe a genetic. A uh, lot of alcohol. Yeah, then, then probably acid base or acid exposure. Yeah, I can look into it. I'm not immediately familiar with that one. It's probably a good sign. <laughs> if you don't know the one that the alcoholics have, I'm happy about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of alcoholic friends. I shouldn't know about it. All right. Um, so I mentioned before you do have that stratified squamous epithelium that is non keratinized. And then at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach, we have a, a sudden change from that stratified epithelium to a simple columnar epithelium. And this is simple columnar. The way you have to read this histology is that we, is that we are looking at... Um, pits. Gastric pits and gastric folds are happening right here. So it's actually that this is the epithelium formed like this. And when you read it like that, you can see that it takes a different form. Any questions right now? Okay, so your stomach does have gastric pits and gastric glands. Those pits actually help create the glands, so that's the structure of the gland is that pit, is another way to phrase this. Now in the stomach, you have the same layers that you have throughout the gut tube. A mucosa, a submucosa, a muscularis, and a serosa. Again, it's a serosa because you can reach into the abdominal cavity and grab that stomach. You know, if you're a surgeon, not day to day. Um, it may be worth pointing out there's three layers to the muscularis here. You've got the cir good old oh, circular layer, good old longitudinal layer, just like you have in the esophagus. You also have an oblique layer, so the stomach can basically compress from all sides. 
Here's the last topic I'm going to cover before we go on break. The next couple of slides take a little bit of um, mental work, so it'll be good to go into those after break. Histologically, you have several types of cells lining that gastric pit, making up that gastric gland. We're mainly going to focus on sheath and parietal cells. You will also need to know about mucus cells. Uh, we will utilize the product of enteroendocrine cells, but that naming convention is not as important to you. So start with chief and parietal cells. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen. Their chief product is pepsinogen and gastric lipase. We're going to focus on pepsinogen. That's going to be a precursor molecule that's going to help you break down proteins. Parietal cells are going to secrete hydrochloric acid, HCl. Now, sometimes people get the products mixed up. I know I did it undergrad. I really wanted the P to go with the P. I wanted parietal cells to release pepsinogen because it fit into my brain better. But it is counterintuitive here. The parietal cells are secreting hydrochloric acid, whereas the chief cells are the ones that are secreting pepsinogen. Does the pepsinogen break down protein? Pre pepsinogen breaks down protein. That hydrochloric acid, it's literally an acid. You're that alien monster spitting acid onto its food. You're just doing it internally. What's the other one that breaks the protein? Um, gastric lipase. And lipase is going to be an enzyme that breaks down lipids. What do you think mucus cells are going to secrete? Mucus or mucin, to be more specific. And again, we will use gastrin as a hormone and see its effects. In fact, the next slide is going to call these cells G cells. If you want to think of these as G cells, that's perfectly acceptable. If, G, if learning that G cells secrete gastrin makes life easier for you, go ahead and do it. Okay, it's perfect time for a break. Any questions before I stop recording?